So, all right, well, I've got, I think I've got six of the one on my phone, so we'll go ahead and start. So and uh, yeah. this will probably take us a little bit, a lot, we've got a lot of material to cover here, so <laughs> we'll go ahead and start and get, get going. So, thanks for coming tonight, and thanks for watching online if you're catching up. So, uh, let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, we just come before your throne, and Lord, just uh, thank you for the time we can to uh, look at this topic again and uh, to see how we can share Christ with a uh, different uh, people group uh, tonight as we look at the LGBT community. And uh, Lord, just pray that you'll give us wisdom, give us understanding, and uh, give us a passion to, to share our faith and to have gospel conversations with uh, everybody that we can come in contact with. Uh, we love you. We just pray all these things in, in Jesus' name. I pray. Amen. 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 All right. So, a little bit weird. I know when I do these outlines, I'm like, okay, this is you know what this group believes. And we kind of talk about the different religions. And I was like, okay, well, we're doing <laughs> something that's not really a, a religion, but maybe it is to some people. <laughs> yeah, some people look at it that way. Uh, but anyway, so we look at the you know sharing Jesus with the LGBTQIA plus <laughs> community. <laughs> And uh, yeah. that, that, that acronym or whatever you want to call it, the initialism, it keeps getting longer, right? Um, but uh, it's been used since the 1990s. So it was relatively a, a new term, about 30 years or so. Uh, but it's, it's kind of an umbrella term that uh, represents certain sexualities or sexuality groups or sexual identities that people uh, kind of give themselves there's a lot of different varieties that, that fall under these umbrellas. Uh, sometimes it's just shortened to the LGBTQ, LGBT, uh, just for the sake of a mouthful. <laughs> but uh, the, the, all those different letters, you may know what the first four or five letters stand for, but maybe you've never heard the IA and all this stuff. That's sometimes not mentioned there, but just you know, I put them in the notes there. It's the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, intersex, and asexual. So, uh, I don't know, we'll, <laughs> if you have a question about any of those, well, you know. What's the difference? Uh, well, um, we can go through all the, uh, transgender, we'll just start, I think you understand what a lesbian and, and gay is. Oh, the transgender is, is the person that yeah. changed their... Yeah, tra yeah, they change their gender the or their gender, sex yeah. Yeah, um, from one to the other. Uh, queer is, is kind of a is, is kind of a, a term. Person. Well, it kind of is, is the weird, just the the, the I, don't, I want to use weird in a bad way, but it's just the the strange, different things that you might find in there. You might you put the uh, what is the the drag queen might fall oh. under the queer category there they are, that's a little uh, something different they're more feminine. uh well and it could be either way there but uh the intersex is, is somebody who identifies as both or has both sexual organs uh, uh, dance around the words <laughs> as we talk about some of the stuff but, yeah yeah it is, is 2023 crazy. right yeah. but uh and then the asexual is is maybe that's a new term you know the word a is is kind of the, the antonym for for not for some people identify as an asexual, not having one gender or the other, they, they just are neutral. They have no gender. That's kind of what the asexual means there. And the plus, which you see on that, is, is just for everything else that they might call on. You know, some of these social media platforms, uh, I think it was a couple of years ago, if you logged on to Facebook and created an account, you could choose from one to 47 different genders that you identified with so these here and others you know 47 you know <laughs> so that's gone a long way from from two that is the plus. yeah yeah. <laughs> See, yeah, that, yeah that's the plus exactly so um yeah so there's it's come a long way um so i, I thought okay it might be good to give you just a few kind of newer terms that you might not be familiar with some of these i'm sure you are but uh, I thought and then a lot of the new things that have come out of the, the second sexual revolution, I think, that we're in, we have is, is more along the lines of the transgender stuff. That's the newer stuff that we're uh, you know, talking about. That's the hot topic. Um, so I, I kind of specifically put some of these terms in there that you might not be familiar with. The first one there is cisgendered, or it might be just called cisgender. Sometimes it's abbreviated as cis 
Well, that, you might hear somebody, well, you're cis. <laughs> what? <laughs> that It's short for cisgendered. It just means that you are, you identify as the uh, sex or the uh, gender that you were born as. So I was born a male, and I still identify as a male. So I'm a cis male. I'm cisgendered, you know, uh, and, and so on. So that's kind of what that word means. Uh, gender fluid, I don't know if you've ever heard that term before, but that's, if you think about it, uh, fluid is something that motion and moves, right? Uh, talk about these terms, just out of curiosity. You know, I, I, it's, it's not, it's not, yeah. you know, we always talk about it based on science, and this uh, is not based on uh, Yes, science. this is very, very, you know, in fact, to transgender, to, to, to change genders, you have to know what the different genders are, so it's kind of, a, it kind of crosses itself out. And, and way, uh, yeah. uh-huh. There's a lot of confusion. So, but to be gender fluid is somebody who is moving from one gender to the other. A uh, person who doesn't identify with a single gender often uh, or fixed gender. Uh, their, their gender is subject to change. So for a couple of years, they might identify as a male. Uh, and then a couple of Years after that, they may say, well, I'm, I'm, I was gender fluid, so, but now I'm identifying as a female. And they, they're they like a chameleon that changes colors or something, you know, they, except they change their gender. So that's something that's kind of newer on the scope of things. Uh, non-binary, well, you know, binary is, you know, like on, off, only two things. Uh, some people identify as, as non-binary, meaning that it's a person who doesn't identify exclusively as a man or a woman. Uh, they may identify as both uh, male and female. So um, they're, they're non-binary. They, they can kind of move them up to that. Uh, transitioning, you've probably heard this term a lot lately, uh, but it, it involves the, the process of some, someone undergoing a physical change to their body to match the gender that they believe they are. Uh, you know, this could be, it's done various ways through surgeries, cutting things off or attaching things on, uh, taking hormones to, to stifle, you know, um, the, some of these drugs that the uh, transgender uh, take are some of the drugs that they use to chemically castrate uh, sex offenders. And they're, they're permanently damaging their body. Uh, it, it's causing, you know, it's, you can come off of these things and your body is, is naturally fights it to a point you know, you're, you're, if you're a man, you produce testosterone, you're a woman, estrogen. And, and you know, if, if you stop taking these drugs, but it still kind of permanently affects your body uh, some way, you know, no matter if you maybe only been doing that for a couple of months or a couple of, you know, but it, it still does that. Uh, some people also undergo therapy to, to try to undergo transitioning as well and, and to, to help line up their, maybe their, it might be something as simple as their mannerisms, you know. It's not that they, well, I identify as a woman, so I'm going to take therapy to help me, you know, know how to talk or walk or, or you know. So that those are all different types and ways of, of transitioning there. So um, a couple other terms here kind of related to church, and this where we'll kind of turn it towards the, the church discussion too. Um, churches, according to the LGBTQ community, they will label you and I as either one of two types of churches. We will either be uh, an affirming church or a non-affirming church. So I'll just go ahead and tell you, Westside is a non-affirming church. We do not affirm the, the LGBTQ, um, you know, that that is something that is right and okay. Uh, but other churches out there, we, you know, we've talked about progressive Christianity and progressive churches, they, they welcome all and they would be called an affirming church. That you know, um, we I've had a phone call here uh, six months ago. Somebody picked and hey, uh, I just wanted to ask if you're an affirming church. And, and so I'm like, oh well, I can say it right away, and that's going to end that conversation, you know. But I said, well, we, and I tried to do it in a long way, but after I think they got the <laughs> the general idea, click, you know, yeah. they got what they wanted to know. So uh, you know, but uh, or you can also sometimes. Affirming churches can also be called allies. That's another term uh, that is used. Or maybe a person could be an ally. If you are, maybe you yourself don't identify in the LGBTQ community, 
but you consider yourself an ally that you support them. So that's another word that sometimes people use. Uh, a couple of other um, last minute things here before we move on to the next section. The affirming churches or groups are, sometimes are called a couple of different other names. They're, they're also you know, revisionists. This comes from Matthew Vines uh, and his project, which we'll talk about here in just a minute. Uh, Matthew Vines is a gay uh, minister. He, he started what's called the Reformation Project. Uh, and uh, they, they want to teach and train people to go into churches just like ours and try to change them from the inside out. Uh, and that's, that's something that I do. They teach 10 points uh, and they teach people. They, they have these conferences all around the United States and they, they send them out and, and they plug them into churches. So that's why we do our due diligence when, when somebody joins our church. That we ask them, you know, do they biblically, you know, sit down and have a conversation with them, find out where they're at biblically on, on things, and if you know they would agree with our statement of faith here at Westside. And, uh, but you know that's that's something that we need to do. Uh, the, the revisionists uh, also there's another guy, Justin Lee, who started what's called the Gay Christian Network, the GCN. Uh, it's another major group that's out there. Um, here, here's his book. I uh, read it. Uh, it's called Torn. Interesting. <laughs> Ironically enough, when I when I got it in the mail, it, it was torn. So, <laughs> you anyway, uh, know, we had a family member read this and, and say, "Oh, this was good," and, and I said, "Let me read it and let me offer my thoughts on that." And you, you're welcome to borrow this if you want. I have my notes all in it and everything like that. But um, he he teaches. You know, he goes through here, and what we're going to look at tonight, he, he tries to use the scriptures in the Bible say that the Bible is okay with same-sex marriage and, and all this stuff. And so he, he twists and uses a different interpretation of the historic Christianity, which we'll, we'll look at tonight. So, um, so we'll get into that. So All right, so those are the different kind of terms. And there's more, but that's just the ones I felt like. Are there any questions you guys have about any of these or maybe something else that you want to ask about before we go on to the next section? Um, First off, of the, did God really say? Uh, yes, yeah, right. That's the you know the first the four words. Did God really say? That's a cause that doubt say? about the word of God. Right? Did yeah. God really say? No. It's confusion with sauce. I I hear that they can adopt children. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. So do those children going to learn to be like that? Probably so. Yeah. You know, not not all of them, perhaps, but you know, when you're raised in an environment, when you're nurtured. With certain beliefs, you tend to grow up believing them, right? You know, it does, doesn't make them right. You know, just like for us as Christians, many of us may have grown up Christians because our parents were. You know, it doesn't mean that Christianity is true, right? That's the whole separate issue. But you know, uh, I believe it is. But uh, so any beliefs we have, we should look at. You know, we should believe them because they're true, not just because we have a, a you know a foundation in them or we were raised that way. No matter what it is, that, that should be, you know, good question. All right, uh, we'll go to the next section here. Um, I jump, sorry, jump right out there. Here's interesting stats on the left hand side there. Um, according to a Gallup poll 2022, and it's on the back page four. If you flip it over, you can see it. But according to a last year poll from Gallup, approximately 7.2% of the United States identifies as LGBTQ. Um, and it's interesting there, the, the same poll discovered that Gen Z, and that's those born from 1997 through uh, 2011, that's the kind of the latest generation here, that almost 20% of Gen Z identify as LGBTQ. So you can see on that, on the uh, background there, you can see that's the red bar there. Um, to me, that definitely says this is not just a genetic thing. This is a social contagion that is taught and caught, uh, you know, by social media and TV and media. Uh, that, that just shows you. Uh, there was one survey done in uh, Great Britain, I think back in 2020, uh, the amount of teenage girls who had identified as trans went uh, from one year to the next, 2019 to 2020, up 4,000%. 
Uh, wow. And so, you know, and if you're an atheist, if you don't believe in God, everything's genetic. Everything's based on that. So, and that doesn't even make sense, right? You know, because if homosexuality and all that stuff should be being weeded out because of the process of bearing children, and you know, anyway, so that's just interesting. There, I like the quote from Sam Albury. There, hey, come on in. I like the quote there on the left-hand column from Sam Albury. He's a uh, British minister in, in the United Kingdom who struggles with same-sex attraction, but he's, he's written several books. Like you can look. But he says, never put your identity in any part of your sinful nature, <laughs> right? You know, uh, if I struggle with stealing things, I shouldn't go around saying, I'm a thief, I'm a thief. You know, that, that should thief. never be my identity, right? No matter if it's a, a sexual sin or anything else. Well, I'm, I'm an adulterer, right? you know. <laughs> that's not a very good thing that we, you know. That's how I would say I agree with Sam Albury there. So <laughs> um, there's uh, David Kinnaman who wrote a book called Unchristian on the left-hand column there. Uh, he's the president of Barna Research, but uh, he... He's, in his research, what he's discovered, he says, outsiders say our hostility towards gay is not just the opposition to homosexual politics and behaviors, but disdain for gay individuals has become virtually synonymous with the Christian faith. And then Sean McDowell comments on that. He says, in other words, he says, according to his research, if you say I'm a Bible-believing Christian, you, you might as well go ahead and say, and I hate gays. That that's the mentality that many in the LGBT community think and believe that Christians hate them. That there was it was like ninety percent, nine out of ten, in the LGBT community think that Christians hate them. And, you know, we'll talk about that when we get to the end of the lesson tonight. And that's one of the first things we want to make sure we clearly express: we we don't hate you. <laughs> you know, that's that's the first thing we need to make sure. You know, even though that's their perception, it doesn't mean that that's reality. So uh, just because you have a different opinion about something doesn't mean you don't care for somebody. That's, that's something I think we need to make sure it's, it's clear. So, all right. So the next section there says, what do the LGBT uh, affirming churches believe? I kind of wanted to just focus on, on this, you know, okay, because, again, you know, we talked about progressive Christianity a couple weeks ago. Um, what do, and I wanted to kind of connect this with, People who say, "Well, I'm a Christian, but I'm also gay," or I identify. You know, I, I wanted to kind of bring the conversation into that whole topic there. But uh, many of the LGBT community uh, affirming churches believe some of these main things. Again, not everybody believes the same thing. If you're watching online, you may say, "That's not me." I understand. These are some general, <laughs> uh, you know, just specifications that that many kind of will click with and identify. And again, not everybody is the same. And the best thing for all of us to do is, is actually talk to somebody, figure out what they believe. But uh, So kind of going through these bullet points there, um, uh, many in the LGBT community still want to hold on to some part of their Christian faith, but they either want to rewrite, rewrite it somehow, they want to rewrite the church history saying, oh, we had it wrong, uh, they want to create an alternative interpretation, and we'll talk about that tonight. Uh, or sometimes they just they ignore what the Bible plainly says. And so that's really the three ways that they will try to get around the issue and, and you know, still try to claim <clears throat> some kind of connection to their Christian faith. Uh, so the bulletin points, we'll look at number one there. Uh, the, many of them say that the church has perverted the issue and made several biblical texts um, about homosexuality, uh, you know, bigger a bigger deal than it actually is. You know, they'll say, well, there's only so many scriptures, and the Bible doesn't talk about it as much as it talks about uh, X, Y, Z, or something else. They'll they'll, they'll say something like that. Um, they'll say that, if, for example, in Genesis 19, when we come to the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, the two cities that God destroyed by fire, they'll say that was misunderstood. Uh, that that uh, God did not destroy those cities because of their homosexuality. It was for other things. And they'll, they'll name stuff like uh, for gang rape. They'll say it was for the brutal rape of uh, trying to rape these two men that were friends of you know, the, the angels that were there with Lot. Or they'll, they'll go to another passage. Oftentimes the, the most popular one is Ezekiel 16. 
uh, you know, according to the Bible, Sodom and Gomorrah had many sins. Uh, and if you go to Ezekiel 16, uh, verse 49 and 50, it says there, uh, especially in verse 49, that uh, it says, your sin, why don't we go ahead and flip to it real quick. Well, while we're here, let's look at it. Um, Ezekiel, yeah, Ezekiel 16. That's okay. Yeah, you can check it out there. So Ezekiel uh, chapter 16, verse 49 and 50. Uh, many of them will point out verse 49 and kind of not talk about uh, verse 50 as much uh, because of, uh, Ezekiel 16. Yeah, 16. Ezekiel 16. Ezekiel 16. Ezekiel 16, and we'll start in verse 49. Um, there's, there's, the Bible says a lot, even in the New Testament, about Sodom and Gomorrah, but this is one of the ones that the LGBTQ affirming churches will often quote because it doesn't focus as much on... Um, the homosexuality issue there, but they'll, they'll quote, verse 49 says, Now this was the sin of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters were arrogant, so they're talking about pride, uh, overfed and unconcerned. They did not help the poor and the needy. So there, there, there's the accusation from LGBTQ affirming churches that they were prideful and they were not inhospitable. They, they did not welcome in people and they'll that's why they'll quote, but I just, if somebody ever quotes you Ezekiel 16, 49, say, read one more verse. Read, read verse 50. Um, and it continues, and it says, they were haughty, so there's pride again, and they did detestable things before me. Therefore, I did away with them, as you have seen. That word detestable there is the same word. Some translations use abomin abominable, abomination things. It's the same word that's used when we get to the scripture in, in Leviticus when it talks about the sin of homosexuality. So, you know, yes, the, Sodom had multiple, yeah, Sodom, Sodom had multiple sins <clears throat> that they dealt with. Maybe they had pride, maybe they had inhospitality, but there was also one sin that was worthy of being destroyed with. And, and you know, we, what, what do you do when you study the Bible? Which, what are those sins? We'll, we'll get to those in just a minute. So that's uh, what many of them will say about Genesis 19, that, well, it was, God destroyed them for other reasons. They'll kind of minimize the homosexuality uh, issue there. The third thing, uh, they'll talk about Leviticus 18 and 20, which we'll look at in just a little bit. They say those don't count today. Those are Old Testament passages. And not only are they Old Testament, but they are what's, part, what's called part of the holiness code, uh, chapter 17 through 26 deal in Leviticus there deal specifically with um, what uh, the Israelites were to do when they came to offer a sacrifice. They were how to, to cleanse themselves, how to purify themselves, and also how to, to not model the uh, pagan worship of the other gods of the nations around them. This is how they were supposed to be different. Uh, that's what that... Uh, uh, and so... But Leviticus 18 is kind of an interesting chapter. It's like it, it you're reading along 17, also 18, just it flip. We'll, we'll get into these passages in a minute. It's like it was purposely put there, inserted, and we'll, we'll talk about that in just a minute. But that's one of the things they say is that, well, it's Old Testament, and it's part of the sacrificial system of going before the Lord and presenting the sacrifice, so we no longer have to do that. Therefore, we don't have to look at Leviticus 18, Leviticus 20, anymore. Uh, that's, that's how they will dismiss uh, those very blatant Old Testament passages we'll look at in just a minute. Um, the, then they go to the New Testament. The LGBTQ affirming churches will say, well, the New Testament barely mentions it. They'll say, you know, uh, Jesus never said anything about it. Uh, they'll say this was something that was pervasive in the Roman culture in the first century. And if it was pervasive, then why didn't Jesus mention it? Why didn't Paul talk about it more than he did? It was just barely mentioned, right? Uh, there's, there's answers to all these things. I'm just kind of giving you what, what they say now. Um, fourthly, fifthly, uh, the most common type of homosexuality practiced in the first century in, in Rome, especially, was called pederasty. This was Sorry, we have to hear this. <laughs> but this was when uh, the Roman citizens who owned uh, young boy slaves would have their way with these young boys. 
uh, that were often 12 years old and, and around that age, uh, that was, that was, there was a specific term for that, it was called pederasty. Uh, that's where we kind of get the word pedophilia from today. Uh, it's, if you're familiar with that term, but, and, and many of the LGBTQ affirming churches would say that was the most common type of homosexuality that was practiced in the first century. And I say, I agree, that was. That is what the most common that we knew about. It was very pervasive. But well, we'll look at the scriptures here in just a minute. It, there was also other things going on as well. So, but, um, so that's, that's one thing. Uh, other, you might have heard this lately. This has been in the news. There was a movie that came out last year uh, called 1946. And, and the, the authors or the editors of the Revised Standard Version, which came out in 1946, uh, we're the first uh, modern English translation to use the word homosexuals. Uh, and the word itself, homosexuals, was uh, created by a, a German, I think it was, uh, psychologist in the late 1800s. That was, you know, it's an English word, right? So, but the the idea of it is goes back, you know, to Genesis 19 and, and further. But um, so some people will say, well, the, the Bible, it was added in. And so they'll... They'll just say, you know, it wasn't an issue until people put it into the Bible by changing the text. And we'll come to that in just a minute. We'll talk about what that. Um, uh, then other people will say that homosexuality has changed over the centuries. Uh, it used to be more abusive, but they don't, the Bible didn't know about the loving homosexual relationships that we have today. And, and that they're more long lasting and, and and so we have to look at it in a whole new light. That's kind of one of the other things that they, they say about the issue. Uh, we'll come back to that as well. Um, uh, let's see here. Uh, that, uh, another thing they'll say is, well, the biblical authors didn't understand homosexuality like we do today. They don't understand this whole idea about an orientation, that people were just naturally bent towards this type of love toward the same sex person or whatever uh, and so therefore we can't so you see what that's doing that's taking the authority of god's word and saying well we know more as scientists or, you know men now than we than god's word does so that's kind of what the excuse is there uh, as far as, as that goes um, and actually that long i'm not going to read it to you but that whole long left-hand column there is proof that that's not true um there, there are at least five sources that I can give you. I have a, I have a book that has all these first, uh, first sources. These are primary sources that talk about the uh, what the people in the all going all the way back to the fourth and fifth century BC believed about people's orientation. This was something that we see uh, written in Plutarch. Uh, some of the names I wrote down there: uh, Plato, Aristotle, Serenus, Aristophanes. I'll let you read that left-hand column on your own, but that's those are some primary sources from the the one in the white is the fourth century there, uh, and then the one in the yellow at the bottom from Aristophanes is the uh, fifth century, and you can read these in their you know, you know translations in, in English, and you can see that they they knew there was a quote orientation back then, and you know so to, to kind of claim that well people back then were ignorant that's the whole. Just to the kinds of, they don't they didn't know what we know today, uh, and, and that clearly when you read these fourth and fifth century uh, sources, you can see yeah they kind of thought the same thing that we do today. You know, as much as we think this is all new, it's been around a long time, and people have been dealing with it. Um, and if you'd like more sources on that, I'll be glad to give you more. I can I can email them to you. I've got it on an electronic <coughs> electronic book uh, there. Uh, the, the last one is, maybe you've heard this too, that why, why would God create someone uh, that had this disposition or this desire for the same sex if it wasn't okay, right? Uh, and, and so they will use that and, and say, well, you know, the, again, kind of trying to water down the authority of the Bible. The, you know, they'll say, well, these Old Testament, these New Testament authors, they were just writing down their best understanding at the time, but they don't know what we know today. That's, that's kind of the argument that they go through there. Um, uh, and then interesting, you know, some of these 
religions we look at, we look at their holy books and the things that they use as authoritative and what scripture is. Uh, and and uh, it's the thing though that you see it do do the LGBTQ affirming churches use a different Bible? Uh, most of the time they do not, but there is actually what they call the Queen James Bible. <laughs> it was it was published in 2012. Uh, I've actually seen a copy. I went to a, a conference in Charlotte, North Carolina, back in 2018 or 19, and uh, saw the actual Bible. And what they do in the Queen James Bible is they they cut out eight passages, the, what's what's known as the clobber verses in the Bible that speak about homosexuality, and they just they cut them out. You know, so what, what's the thing that everybody's always talking about? Thomas Jefferson, who was a deist, and cut out. Stuff in the Bible he didn't agree with. Well, that's what the Queen James Bible does. That's what the, the uh, you've ever heard of the African Slave Bible, right? The, unfortunately, that some people you know, gave the African slaves that they didn't want them to know that the Bible spoke against slavery. So they cut out the, the passages. It's one of the, the African Slave Bible is one of the greatest things that teaches us that the Bible is against slave, slavery, you know. But the Christians did it otherwise. So. Well, John, doesn't the Bible say that Jesus don't change it by John or kill? Right, 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 um, yeah. Mm -hmm. right yeah. There are several places in the Bible, Deuteronomy and the book of Revelation warns us about changing the Bible, right? Yeah, but they, they feel like it's, and again, that's all you do that to the Bible when you feel like the Bible is not inerrant, right? You know, we believe at Westside that the Bible is inerrant and it's inspired by God. It's God breathed, you know, and, um, and we dare not change it. But if, but if you have a different view of the Bible, well, it's not a perfect book. It's just written by men who understood God the best way they could. Then you can go through here and, you know, take scissors and cut out stuff. So that's things you don't like. Yeah, things you don't like. Well, you know, and the, again, the progressive Christians do that often. They they don't like uh, Paul a lot. You know, they, they love well, we love Jesus until he he disagrees with them. But uh, you know, so so that's definitely part of that. So all right, um, any any questions on any of those beliefs before we move on to the actual scriptures? And, um, um, it's not a question. It's that I don't understand. Why do a man have to love a man, or I or vice versa? Uh -huh. I don't understand that. Sure. The um, more I think about it, I can't sure. understand. Well, I, and Anna, there's probably several reasons why someone may feel that way. I, my thoughts and my understanding of this issue, since I've read books and and, and I've come to, it's, it's changed. You know, I I believe, and this I I believe with all my heart. There there are people that struggle with what's called we will call same-sex attraction they for whatever reason are attracted to someone of the same sex whether they're a man with a man or a woman with them and many of them do not want that and they try to to you know they do whatever it can take to try to get rid of that feeling um and, and i understand that I, I, I even know one or two people that have said they struggle with this um but at the same time, you know, think think about it in a non-sexual issue way. Do not do we not all struggle with something, whether it might not be a, a sexual sin or desire. Some of us may struggle with a, an attitude or a temper, or some of us may struggle with the words that come out of our mouths, or or we, you know, for for those those of us who are heterosexual, we we may struggle with uh, looking at someone of the opposite sex and, and having thoughts that we shouldn't have about them. So we, we all struggle. Um, and, and, I, and the retort often is, well, but I have this desire for the same sex and I can't you know, have a marriage or I can't, you know. And, but there, there's, as Christians, we all struggle with something, you know. Um, and, and so that's, we have to kind of come to that understanding too. And, well, I understand yeah. that people, some yeah. people struggle, but I still don't understand Sure, yeah, but you, because you may not struggle with that, you know, yeah. personally, it doesn't, so, yeah, and that's okay, um, uh, you know, but it we looks all like struggle. It, it looks like they um, are committing a very big sin against God, 
Right. And, you know, that's the, the whole thing, you know, is, is this really an issue that we should make a big deal out of it? Well, when we come to the scriptures, you know, I think that's what we have to answer and, and, and say, what does the Bible say about that? And, it, you know, the question is, is this a gospel issue? Is this something that is going to determine whether or not somebody goes to heaven or not? And I, I think we'll, we'll look at here at the scripture in just a minute. I think we'll see that, yes, indeed it is. Uh, when we get to 1 Corinthians 6. And, uh, and so it could that's, be something unnormal you know, in their body, in their genes, maybe? Well, and here's and all the reading and research that I've done, there there is more evidence for alcoholism uh, being a genetic issue than there is homosexuality. Uh, there, there is really not a lot of uh, scientific or genetic or DNA evidence for homosexuality. That, you know, you probably remember this several years ago. It was I was born this way. That was that was often repeated. Well, here comes the trans trans movement. And you don't hear that anymore. Why? Why? Because if you're born a certain way, then you can't change and trans. Uh, yeah, you know, and so that kind of went away. Um, They're taking it like too far, so, like changing the whole body from a man to a woman or a woman to a man, yes, and that is yeah, like yeah, some sacrilege. People, some right? some, do some people do, like you know. So, okay, any other questions before we move on? If, if I don't, uh, I'm going to go through these scriptures, and if there was one of those beliefs on the bulleted points there that, that I don't address, if you want to know the answer, make sure you come back at the end and, and ask me about that. I want to make sure I cover all the, the bases about what they believe. Um, uh, anyway, so, but now, okay, so let's look at the scriptures because, again, uh, many like Matthew Vines or Justin Lee uh, who write these books and they, again, try to hold on to their Christian faith, but yet they come to the Bible with a different perspective or a different interpretation of a passage. Um, so now let's just take a look at these passages briefly and talk about them because I want you to be able to, if somebody has a discussion with you, I want you to be able to, to talk about them and be able to explain them and, and to kind of show where maybe what they think is the, their interpretation is, is not actually what, what it is. So, but, um, so it all starts in Genesis, right? You know, uh, going back to Genesis 1 and 2, the creation story. Uh, you know, is, is, does it still apply? Is it still applicable? A answer, yes. <laughs> yeah, everything, in fact, everything that Jesus said in the New Testament about this issue and Paul, they both go back and quote from Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. Um, and so to me that says that this uh, creation story where God created man, one man, one woman, this all connects and it's important for us to start there and have a understanding that, that God created people in either male or female and in his image right um, that's the you know that's the whole gender issue is, is right there uh, sorry social media sorry Facebook there's not 47 genders according to the Bible there's, there's two you're male or you're female uh, you know um, that's that's what the Bible teaches uh, Genesis 19 uh, I already mentioned this a little bit Sodom and Gomorrah a little bit. I wrote down some very quick little notes in here. So when you read these, you remember what? Let me try to explain some of these. I was trying to pack as much information as I could into this. Um, you've heard what it said. You know that people say, well, Sodom and Gomorrah was not really about homosexuality. It was about inhospitality or pride, or it was about gang rape, uh, but not homosexuality. So that's often the the quip that is given. Well. In, in the Hebrew there, the word uh, that is important to understand is yada. Yada, yada, yada. Right? So it, and that's the word in Hebrew for to know. Um, all right? It's used 1,058 times in the Old Testament. <laughs> and only 15 of those times it refers to, to knowing somebody in a, in a an innuendo. How do you say that? Innuendo? It's a, meaning a sexual way, a relationship. So some people will say, well, they'll try to come to Genesis 19 and say they just wanted to have fellowship with these two men, visitors of, of Lot. They, they didn't want to have sex with them. They wanted to just to get to know them. Uh, and if that is the case, then you, then you have to go to verse 8 there and say, wait a minute. 
that doesn't make sense if you read the text in the way it should be because Lot offers his two daughters and as crazy and as sick as this is, it just shows you the depravity of, of Lot and where he was at. But he says, wait, wait, take, take my two daughters. They have not known any other men. Well, if it's just to know them, it'd be kind of ridiculous to think, well, my daughters, they don't know anybody. They, they haven't met you. You know, it, it just doesn't fit in the context. So this is used in a, as a euphemism for you know having a sexual relationship with that you know that's that's what it talks about there <clears throat> similarly a couple passages in the new testament talk about the the, the story of Sodom and Gomorrah in several places Jesus talks about it and but also second peter chapter 2 verse 4 through 10 and Jude verse 7 all all talk about the story of Sodom and Gomorrah they talk about the city that did something detestable and again there's that word that we kind of talked about a while ago. Um, while ago, that's a country word, <laughs> a while ago, but uh, a while ago. But uh, they, this word detestable, and we'll get to Leviticus in just a minute. We talked about uh, some of these sins that were detestable before the Lord, that were abominable. Um, both Peter and Jude talk about Sodom and Gomorrah saying the sins they did were abominable, and they it, it even describes, and I'll let you read those on your own time, uh, but especially Jude there talks about the sins of Sodom were of a sensual na nature. So there's, a, again, a sexual connection there. Uh, we've already mentioned Ezekiel 16, so we won't go into that. But again, just keep reading. <laughs> and that's, I've found some of these books, uh, like Torn here, and some of the other uh, scholarly books that I've read from like James Bronson and some others that try to uh, change the scripture. They, it's like they'll pick certain things out of the Bible, but they won't read all of it. You know, so just just whatever helps support their point of view in, in that you know, discussion. Uh, and so you see that right there in Ezekiel 16. So. All right, any questions about Sodom and Gomorrah before we move to Leviticus? Ooh, Leviticus. <laughs> that's, that's the book you read when you can't sleep at night. That'll put you right to sleep right there. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah. All right, uh, Leviticus 18, verse 22, and Leviticus 20, verse 13 are the two passages that talk about homosexuality uh, in the Old Testament very, very blatantly. Let, and we will go, let me just flip to it right now. Uh, go to Leviticus 18, just so you can hear this. Um, the whole chapter 18 is kind of bookended in, in verse 4, and then we'll see in verse uh, 24, 25. Let me just read you so you kind of get a, a picture here. Uh, let me start in verse 1. The Lord said to Moses, Speak to the Israelites and say to them, I am the Lord your God. You must not do as they do in Egypt, where you used to live. You must not do as they do in the land of Canaan, where I am bringing you out. Uh, look, and he says this, Do not follow their practices. This is the, the practices, meaning the, the things, their behaviors they're doing. All right, you follow my decrees. I'm Lord your God. Uh, keep on, and he goes on, and, and then he just starts listing all these things. Most of chapter 18, uh, many of the sexual regulations there, uh, most of them are about incest. You should not have relations with your mother, your sister, and it goes, and it lists like all the different relationships, right? Because you have to know these things, right? <laughs> you know, there, there's all these different. Well, when it comes to the issue, the prohibition. Of, of homosexuality, there's only one verse, kind of meaning, kind of pointing to me that it's it's all wrong. There, there's no, well, it's okay here, but not okay here. Uh, I think God is saying uh, the issue of homosexuality, it's, it's all wrong. No, no matter what kind it is, if it's temple prostitution or if it's, you have to look at your neighbor's tent over there and you, whatever, you know, it, it's all wrong. So so the, the question, the verse in question there uh, is verse 22. And again, this is, you know, it says, do not lie with a man as one lies with a woman. That is detestable. That's pretty plain. And there's that word detestable, right? And that, that's what we see repeated in Ezekiel and, and used in a couple other places. Um, you know, and, and then he goes into verse 25. I don't have sexual relationships with an animal. You know, it's crazy stuff here. But I want to, and then again, remember I said it was kind of this whole chapter is bookend talks about these practices. You look at verse 24. Uh, 
of chapter 18, he says, Do not defile yourselves in any of these ways, because this is how the nations that I am going to drive out before you became defiled. Even the, even the land was defiled, so I punished it for its sins. And so the thing to, to keep in mind here, God, God is not punishing the Canaanite and the other nations around Israel for worshiping other gods. He's punishing them for their behavior and the things they were doing. So the reason why that's important is it wasn't just wrong for Israel because the other nations were doing it. It was wrong because the actual deeds, the actions themselves were wrong. So that's the point there. If you read chapter 18, kind of get home um, as far as that goes. Um, let me make sure I read my notes here. Yeah. Um, so... You know, again, I've already mentioned that there's, there's multiple verses that discuss what incest is and what is not, but there's only one verse when it comes to homosexuality. Hey, hey just don't do it. You know? And we'll see Paul picks up on that in the New Testament when he, when he when we'll come to that in just a minute. Um, all right, any questions on that before we move forward to go to the New Testament now? Okay. So, um, all right. So the accusation where people say Jesus never mentioned anything about homosexuality. And this is true to a sliver <laughs> of a point, or you might say half truth, right? He he never comes out, Jesus never comes out and says, You shall not lie with a man as he doesn't quote, you know, Leviticus 18, uh, verse 22 to anybody in the New Testament that we have knowledge of. Um, but Jesus does in Matthew 19, he does reaffirm creation story Jesus does reaffirm that, that men and women are male and female in Matthew 19 Jesus does affirm that, um, that marriage should be between a man and a woman and it's and he even adds to it um, he quotes from Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 but he also this is interesting this is kind of interesting fact uh, you know you know, the, Hebrew, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, right? And the New Testament is in Greek. Uh, for the most part, there's some in Aramaic. But when, back about 200 in the second century BC, um, the, what's known as the Septuagint was commissioned to be created. The Septuagint is a Greek copy of the Old Testament. It's, it's done in, in Greek. It was done in 70 weeks by 70 different scribes. So that's why you get Septuagint, because Sep is the, the prefix for 70, right? So it's been dubbed the Septuagint. But so the, the Septuagint is a Greek copy of the Old Testament. And, and it, it's different than the Hebrew text that we have now that we found, uh, the Masoretic text. It's, it's slightly just a little bit different. It's like, it's interesting. That's, that's all another conversation where we don't have time to have today. But but Jesus, when he quotes, sometimes he quotes from the Hebrew, but sometimes Jesus quotes from the Septuagint too, which is slightly different. Uh, to make a point, when Jesus is quoting here in Matthew 19 uh, about a man, you know, he goes back to Genesis and quotes Genesis 1 and 2, Jesus quotes these passages and then he adds a word to it he said the two if you go back and you read Genesis 1 it doesn't say you know man shall leave his wife and, the, and they it says they become one it doesn't say the two become one it says they become one well Jesus adds the word two kind of re-emphasizing that marriage is not supposed to be a throuple <laughs> it's not supposed to be three people or four people it's supposed to be between two people a man and a woman so, and everybody, we, again, we love Jesus, right? We want to quote Jesus. Well, Jesus kind of goes back and doubles down on that. He got into this, uh, you can read it, the two different groups of the Jews, the Hillelites and the Shammites. Uh, Jews were having this debate about whether you could properly divorce someone for or not based on, on Deuteronomy 24. The, uh, the liberal Hillelites thought you could divorce your wife if she burned the toast. It was you know, whatever anything could do. Oh, she burned the toast. Well, that's it. You know, she broke the marriage vows. Well, the, the more conservative Jews, the Shemites, they thought, no, no, that's only based on if they broke the traditional marriage vows of being inf infidel. You know, so they, they tried to pull Jesus in this conversation to see which way would he go on that conversation there. Uh, you know, uh, 
that's if you remember the phrase in Matthew, you can go back and read this in, in Matthew 19, he says, for any cause, that was the, the phrase of the first century there, is it, is it right to divorce a woman for any cause, for just burning the toast or not, you know, and, and so Jesus, he, he kind of ignores that whole debate, he's like, he just goes back to Genesis 1 and 2, he's like, hey, this is what God designed it for in the beginning, and he, he said, God allowed Moses to give certificates of divorce, in other words, to, to take care of the women who were, who were being left out and, and without a husband to provide for them. And so God allowed those certificates of divorce. So he, he kind of ignores that whole debate between them there. So, but, so people again say, well, Jesus didn't talk about this issue. In a way, he did. He, he, he talked about what a marriage should be and what it shouldn't be uh, by, by describing this kind of discussion there. So, all right, any questions about that before we go into Romans? All right, uh, Romans chapter one here. This is probably the passage that if, if, I, if, I, only, if I only had one <laughs> passage to share with somebody to talk to them about this issue, it would be right here. It would be Romans chapter one. If you want to flip to Romans chapter one, verse uh, 21, we'll, we'll go there. Uh, this, this passage, in my opinion, has more to say about this issue and it really refutes all the different um, other interpretations that the LGBT community and the LGBTQ affirming churches try to, to push out there uh, by just looking at the text. Um, the, some of the things, the, the revisionists, like if you read this book, Torn Here, it will tell you that some of these words that Paul uses, they don't really mean what you think they mean. They mean something else, like... Um, let me, let me just jump here to, let me read Romans uh, 1 to you, starting at verse 21. It says, For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God, nor gave thanks to him, but in their thinking became futile, their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools, and they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal men and birds and animals and reptiles. So what, this is talking about what? Idolatry, right? No longer are people worshiping God. Now they're worshiping images and animals and all those. That's kind of what Emmanuel was talking about in, in Hinduism, right? They, they tend to worship a lot of images and creation. So then verse 24, Therefore God gave them over in their sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever to be praised. Because of this, verse 26, uh, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural relations for unnatural ones in the same way that men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed indecent acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their perversion. So, this passage will, will break down a lot of these excuses that we've, we've looked at just previously when it goes to Scripture. So first thing, one of the first things that um, revisionists will say, people like Justin Lee and Matthew Vines, they'll say, well, look at verse 26. It says, because of this, God gave them over to shameful lust. Even their women exchanged, here's the key phrase, natural relations for unnatural ones. The homosexual um, advocates and LGBTQ affirming say, well, that means natural to them. <laughs> so, so what might be natural to me, the issue of heterosexuality, to a homosexual person, that's natural to them. And that's the, that's the uh, scripture pretzel they'll try to put in there to say, well, that's what, you know, they were born naturally with this, that. Uh, and so, but if again you look at the scripture here, you'll see it's not the case. Um, first things first. Uh, remember one of the things they said. Well, pederasty, this master slave homosexuality was the most common thing in the first century, which it was. They'll say that's what Paul was talking about here. No, look closely. Look at the scripture here. It wasn't this abusive type of homosexuality that a, a grown man was doing with a, a young slave boy, because look in verse 27, in the same way men, the, the Greek word is men, they're also abandoned natural relations with women, and were 
And here's the key for it. Inflamed with lust for one another. So it's not a, a rape or abuse. They're both inflamed for lust with each other. And, in, and again, it says it doubles down. Men committed indecent acts with other men. If it was meant, if Paul meant to talk about pederasty, there was actually a Greek word for that he could have used. He could have said, don't do pederasty. But he, he doubles down and says here, it's men with other men. He didn't use the word for a boy there. So again, if we just take our time and walk through this scripture, you can see the truth. And to double down on that, it starts out in, in, um, in the previous verse, before, before it talks about men, it talks about women, doesn't it? Right? It says that women exchange relationships with their men for other women. Well, there, there was no female equivalent to pederasty. Right? This was only done by a man to a slave boy. Uh, so this is a, it's talking about lesbianism here, okay? Uh, and, and so there was no female equivalent. So again, so this verse, again, this is, like I said, this is, if I had one verse, this would be the verse, the, the passage that I would go to because it really answers all these questions about that. So the women exchanged, uh, you know, um, the, the relationships with the men with relationships with one another. So it's talking about that. Uh, Make sure I get all these things that I, I plan to mention. Okay. Right. Any questions about that or any other comments on Romans 1? Yeah. And again, if, if, you, you know, if you want to learn more about some of these books, except for that one, <laughs> well, well, they go through the scriptures and I'll explain. I'll give you some references at the end. And they, they walk you through this too, in case this is kind of fast and, and quick. But uh, all right. And the last one here, uh, 1 Corinthians 6, uh, verses 9 through 11, is the last passage to look at with you um, tonight. <clears throat> uh, this is the passage <clears throat> where Paul creates a little bit of a controversy here. <laughs> he, Paul basically created a new word here. It's the word you see on your notes there, arsenokotes. Arsenokotes, <laughs> I can't struggle with that. Uh, but uh, he basically <clears throat> creates a new word here. This is the first time uh, that we find this word in anything in history. There's, there's nothing before Paul writes this word. We find in Greek this word. And, and, what, and this was something common they would do. They would take words and, and combine them. Much like you're talking about earlier. I think somebody said, where did somebody come up with these words? You know, culture just kind of creates things sometimes, right? We, we come up with something and we make a word for it. You know. Well, Paul coined this word, we, we're pretty confident that Paul coined this word because he's the first one to use it, and we don't find anybody before this, and it's used several times. It's used in another place in, in, in 2 Timothy here, but only twice in the Bible this arsenicote is, is used, um, and there's all sorts of arguments on the internet about this word. They'll say, that word, Paul was talking about pederasty. That's the word he was using for it. And again, there's, there's already a word for pederasty. Well, I didn't Paul invent another word if there was already a word that was being used for that. Um, so that's the debate. <clears throat> Paul, knowing who Paul is, right? He's a Jew. He's an Old Testament scholar trained by Gamaliel, you know, the top of the top. Uh, here's, here's what we know about this word, our synecote is. It's basically made out of two root words uh, that you can find in the Old Testament passages. Again, if you go back to the Septuagint, the Greek translation, if you go back to Leviticus 18 and Leviticus 20, uh, you will find both of the, you will find the arson, uh, which means man, and koites means to bed. So it's basically, literally, it's a man better, or a man who beds a man. Uh, you know, that's, people will again say, well, the word homosexuality was invented in 18, whatever it was, and it was put in the Bible true but the idea and the <laughs> what homosexuality you know uh, what the behavior that homosexuals do is not was not invented then <laughs> this has been you know all the way back so but you can see that in the word there how it was used <clears throat> so uh, when Paul uses this term most biblical scholars will say he went back to the Leviticus text that specifically outlined and he, he crafted, he took one from Leviticus 18, one from Leviticus 20, created this word to kind of point out that all homosexual uh, contact of any kind, whether it's pederasty or 
lesbianism or you know whatever. It's all wrong. That's I think Paul's trying to get the point there. Uh, and, and there's a couple of different things we can kind of use to see that and point that out. Um, the the word in Greek also, if you look at the Greek New Testament there, you'll see our synakotes is is paired with the other Greek word malakois there, and that means soft or effeminate. Uh, and and so most biblical scholars think when Paul used those words in tandem, he's talking about how to say this <laughs> the 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 male partner and the the male other partner that's acting like the female partner on the receiving end. I'll just say, okay, sorry. Well, things you never thought you'd hear your pastor say. <laughs> okay, in front of his parents. Okay, <laughs> but, anyway, so, but anyway, so, um, and Paul uses those terms together to kind of point that all homosexual contact and behavior is, is forbidden. You know, and that's, that's the just... Uh, you'll see all sorts of different opinions on this online again, but that's online. But if you go back to the to the scholarly work, you can see where Paul would get these terms from and what he probably actually meant. So when I said a while ago that Paul kind of caused a little bit of a controversy, it's because he he created this word for the first time. We're like, well, it's never been used before, so we don't know in what context that he actually means. But if if you go back to the to the roots of these words, you can see them used in Leviticus there, and that's probably because of who Paul was, what he was trying to convey. So, uh, there, <laughs> that's a mouthful. So, um, let me make sure I got everything. Okay, any questions about any of those scriptures or any comments or on um, any of that? John, yeah. the scriptures, you said a group copy of the Old Testament, yeah, Genesis through. Malachi, yeah, um, it was you know there was a need because it was only the Hebrews could have written and, and you know the Jews most of the Jews at that time you know to second third century BC were speaking Aramaic or Greek and it's crazy you know, even though they <laughs> their heritage was Hebrew many of them could not read uh, the Hebrew Old Testament so there was a need kind of like you know English is the most prevalent language now, so there was a need for an English translation. You know, so there's a need for a Aramaic or a Greek translation of the Old Testament. So that's when, um, and I forget who it was that commissioned it, but you know, again, it, was, it took 70 weeks to complete, and it was done by 70 scribes, so it kind of became known as the Septuagint. So, so uh, yeah. Any, anything else? Any other questions? All right, sorry. Well, let's... Um, let me talk about, okay, so sharing Jesus with those in the LGBT community. This is the most important thing here. We'll just knock these out. Uh, first and foremost, all the, the general tips that we kind of do every week, but here's some new things here. Uh, be tender and compassionate, you know, always with everybody, right? <laughs> you know, there, there may be, you know, uh, I've talked about people that maybe get under our skin more than other people. You know, maybe you have a hard time dealing with, or Jews or, or Muslims or whoever, you know, but if, if the LGBT community causes you to struggle, you know, really, really pray and, and God help get rid of any kind of angst I have and help me to be loving and compassionate towards anybody, no matter who they are, you know, so just, just keep that in mind. Um, and I mentioned this at the beginning, you know, please emphasize that you do not hate them just because they identify the LGBTQ, you know, one way or the other. That you know, make make that known from the very front part of your relationship with them. If you're going to build a relationship with them, to you know, hopefully just befriend them or to help share the gospel with them, you know, you, you may need to say that out front because many in the LGBTQ community think that Christians hate them. And that's just not the case. Just because you have a difference of opinion doesn't mean you hate them, or you know. So that that should be. Make sure you say that. Uh, secondly, um, is, is there anything in your life that would hinder your relationship sharing the gospel with them? Yeah. In the past, have you have you told gay jokes? And, you know, is there, you know, do we need to say, I'm sorry and, and repent of those kind of things? And, you know, that we, we shouldn't do those kind of things, you know, much like we shouldn't uh, tell racial jokes, you know. Uh, those, those have no place, you know. And, and if maybe somebody knows you, and that maybe that's the first step we need to start is, you know what, I wasn't, I wasn't right. I, I made a mistake. I, I told that joke, and you heard that in my office, or 
you heard me say that and around the family and I shouldn't have said that, you know, and that, that's an important place to start there. So, um, so I would encourage you to start there. All right. Now some specific things I would do is, is, um, definitely make sure you define terms, uh, and I'll give a couple of terms specifically the, the word gay and, and, uh, homosexuality or, uh, Orientation, these are words that you need to kind of define as you're having a conversation with somebody. They may mean different things to different people. Um, you probably know this late, lately here, probably in the last 10 to 15 years, if, if someone said they were homosexual, it usually meant that they were practicing that. Well, many people today, it has become their identity of who they are, right? Uh, and that's, I think the devil's trying to do that because if, if you can make it about who somebody is and not who they do then it makes it harder to, to, to discuss that with somebody so but as, as you're talking with somebody uh, and they say they, they may ask you is can a gay person uh, go to can be can a gay person be a Christian my first question is what do you mean by gay <laughs> uh, number one they, they could be calling themselves gay but they're not physically interacting with somebody in a sexual way they're not they're not continually in some kind of a sexual gay behavior they might they might just say that's who I am is my identity but they're they're not actively involved in a male to male or female to female relationship um, that that would be important to be kind of clarified right uh, somebody else might use that term gay just to mean that they have a same-sex attraction. That's SSA, same-sex attraction. Well, I feel attracted towards a man, but I've never been in a relationship with a man or never you know, been married to a man. So, again, define your terms and kind of see what they mean by that because you could think one thing and you start answering the question and they're like, oh, you know. But the Bible makes it clear that only same-sex behavior is sinful. <clears throat> It doesn't say that if, if I have a thought in my head, you know, that, oh, that, you know, just think with, you know, with anything else, not if we're, you know, take it out of the sexual stuff. If I have a thought to steal a candy bar, if it pops in my head for half a second, did I sin? If the thought just came in there, no, I can't do it. <laughs> or if I walk in, I see a stack of cash, I could take that right now, you know. If I don't take it or touch it, and I dismiss that thought, have I sinned? What do you think? If you don't take it, you do sin. Oh, okay. All right. All right. <laughs> I, I, yeah, right. You know, I think we all deal with temptations, right? I mean, the Bible's pretty clear about temptations we deal with, but if we act on them, that's a different thing, right? So, so you just have to be careful with that um, distinction, I guess. Say so. Define define terms there. Um, so again, see see what people mean. Uh, next thing on there, you know, when we talk with someone in the LGBT community, make sure that we teach a holistic view of sexuality. We're not just harping on this one issue. And, you know, somebody may be watching this video. They, they see it on my Facebook page. Well, that's all you talk about, all you Christians. No, I'm here to tell you, if you're watching online or here in our room, that the Bible has a sexual ethic that, that we all need to follow that's much bigger than just this one issue. It, it, the Bible cares about divorce. The Bible t cares about adultery. The Bible cares about fornication, pornography. That's all important, you know. And, and so if you have a conversation with somebody on this issue, make sure that you you bring the whole bucket, <laughs> so to speak, into the conversation. That I'm not just harping about this issue. Yes, God has spoken about this issue, but he's also spoken about how he hates divorce. God also hates adultery and how it breaks up families and, and so on and so on. You know, So I encourage you to talk about the whole uh, issue as a whole and not just you know, focus on this one. It's hard you know, because this is the hot button topic of our, our day. But, but as you get the opportunity, make sure whoever you're talking to knows God doesn't just care about this one issue. It's it's a whole bunch of things too. So that's that's important. Um, discernment here. Um, you know, I think we talked about this two weeks ago. We kind of started talking about this. Figure out who you're talking to. Is the person you're talking to this issue about? Are are they 
a Christian or are they claiming to to follow Christ or are they are they an atheist or some other worldview you know that will determine how you go about talking to them about the subject if my advice to you is if the person that you're talking to about this issue says I, I believe in Jesus he's my savior but I think it's okay in the Bible well I think then you got to go back to the scriptures like that we looked at tonight and you have to slowly walk through those scriptures with them and show them it's not about pederasty. It's not about, you know, this is what the Bible teaches and, and show them. But if it's if they're not a Christian, if they're maybe they're an atheist or maybe they're another religion, I, I wouldn't start with this issue first. I would, I would go to the gospel first and, and talk about their need for a savior first and foremost. Uh, and and then you can work your way around that, and you can you can talk about it if the, if the subject comes up. But that's that's not that person's greatest need to know that homosexuality is wrong. Uh, it's it's their need for a savior is, is the most important thing that they need first. And you can talk about that issue, but I would make a a point to to make it to the cross, make it to the gospel. Uh, that'd be my advice to you there. Um, secondly, or lastly, there prepare to suffer. Uh, this, you know, well, gee, thanks, Pastor. But I, I'm serious. This issue is such a hot button topic. If if you and I are going to speak out on it, I'm, I'm curious what's going to be uh, number one. I'm not. I'm not. I couldn't. I was having the trouble uh, live streaming this to our church group, so I'm live streaming it on my Facebook page, where I have a thousand friends of all different stripes, and I'm wondering if they leave in comments. <laughs> we'll find out. Leave me good comments, people. But, uh, you know, I'm going to post it to our church. But um, pre be prepared to suffer. When, when we talk about this issue, this is people, I mean, you know, because of who they think, this is their identity, who they are. They, they will take it personally when we disagree with them. Again, we don't hate them, but we just disagree that this is something that we should be doing. Um so, so I'm telling you, if, if you're going to discuss this, be, be prepared to suffer because people are not going to like it and, and they're going to try to cancel you. They'll try to, who knows, whatever. But uh, just because you have a different opinion than them. So. All right. Um, down on the left-hand column there, uh, uh, there's a lot of books as far as extra resources. Let me just kind of quickly uh, tell you a little bit about some of these books. The, the Chasing Love book there by Sean McDowell, great book for teenagers, young adults. It's, it's brand new. Uh, covers a lot of topics there. Uh, the next two books there by uh, Kevin DeYoung and Frank Turek are, um, are just some basic good books uh, that talk about this issue. They go through the scriptures. They talk about some of the common objections and things that say those would be good for you. Uh, that. Biblical Response to Homosexuality by Sean McDowell. There's a Logos course. I have a transcript here if you want to borrow that anytime you're welcome to. But he covers a lot of things. He, he really knows it well. The next one down by Robert Gagnon. If you want, like, a scholar, if you're really into this and you want to know about, I would recommend Robert Gagnon. He's a seminary professor. He parses through the scripture. It's not a popular level book. It's, a, it's like a get your glasses on, get ready to learn. He, he goes through all these passages and looks at the things other people say. That's that's where. Now, the next couple of books, uh, pretty interesting, a little bit different here. Uh, the one, People to Be Loved by Preston Sprinkle. That's a, if you're struggling with loving people in the LGBT community, I'd, I'd say read this book. He will help you get a, a passion, a desire to really to love them and to try to help them. Uh, they're. The next couple ones there by Christopher Yuan, Rosaria Butterfield, and Beckett Cook. These are three former homosexuals who have come out of that, and, and they are wildly popular, all great, all three books. They, their books are kind of uh, memoirs, if you will, of, of how they came out of it and the things. That are. Beckett Cook's probably pretty interesting. He was in Hollywood. He was a set designer. I'm not exactly sure, but... He's got a great, he was rubbing it up with all these celebrities and he talks about his story when he, when he came to Christ, they all rejected him and it's just interesting. But I would recommend all three of those books. If, if you know somebody who's, you know, this, this, those three books would be great books to give. Uh, Rosario Butterfield uh, was a lesbian college professor and a pastor invited her into his home and just welcomed her with open arms 
and just begin a relationship. And uh, she's got some great books there. Uh, just I just highly recommend those. Uh, Love Thy Body is the book that deals with the transgender issue by Nancy Percy. She's great. And, the, and this last one, Irreversible Damage by Abigail Schirer. She's not a Christian, but her book on the transgender stuff right there is quoted by so many Christians. They all recommend it, and it's really a, a good book I would recommend to you. I put some of the websites down there. But uh, All right, any questions, comments, or snide remarks? I know we're 15 minutes over, Dad. Yeah. Hey, years ago, did a movie Mm -hmm. Yeah, that word is changed means, you know, quite, quite a bit. Anybody else? Thank you all for Excellent. staying, staying over. Excellent work, Excellent effort. Appreciate your yeah. putting all this together. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, Pastor John. You I will never be um, on time to Wayne. Right. Yeah, we should. I mean, I don't know who they are, but if I ever come to Wayne, well, I will never be on time right. because I'm not on time to anybody. That's right. That's right. That's how we should be with everybody, right? Yeah. All right. Any other questions or comments? Yeah. Uh, well, if I can be of any assistance to any of you, if, if you know, you've got a family member or a coworker, you know, if I can give you more resources, I've got way more than we can just talk about in an hour. I'd be glad to. So it's just one oh. book. It is uh, that the, the, they are prayers for the LGBT and then they come back. Yeah, the three. three. The three, yeah, uh, they yeah, are Christopher, uh, Christopher Yuan. Yuan. Who, yeah, I yeah. know. He, he's an Asian. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he was actually in prison here in Atlanta, came to Christ in prison. Uh, he's got a great testimony. Rosario okay. Butterfield, the next one. Yeah, okay. And then the one below that by Beckett Cook, A Change in Affection. All three of them were former That's home. The thing I watched the one. Oh, Rosario Yeah, yeah, that's it. yeah so you mentioned the. The pastor invited her go to a Bible uh, study, yes. like a fellowship, yep. and never uh -huh. mentioned about the yep. Bible for about half a year, more than the more than half a yeah. year. Then they have good relationship. Yeah. Then suddenly she just uh, she don't feel comfortable go back with. Yeah, she's a lesbian. Yes. Yeah, and that lady, right? Yeah. Yeah, she's a beautiful lady. Yeah, yeah. 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 She's and, so and smart her. too. And, yeah. I mean, I think like, she's a professor. Mm -hmm. She is English professor. Yeah, uh, it's really Rosario Butterfield. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's really yeah. amazing. Yeah, her uh, mm -hmm. like uh, the talk. She has a lot of uh, presentation and. Yeah. You'll uh, find all these people yeah. on YouTube if you yeah. Google their names. Even the authors of these books, if you want to Google them on YouTube, you'll see debates with people and just. There's plenty of material out there that's that's good to, to look at. Okay, Christopher Yuan yeah. and. Uh, uh, Rosalie Butterfly, oh, no, Butterfield. Uh, Butterfield, yeah. Butterfield, what's the name? Beckett. And then the last, uh, Beckett Cook. Beckett Cook. Yeah, there's, 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 there's a book called Two of the Unlikely. It's about a girl who wants a lesbian and then she uh, researched it or something. And okay. And it was. And okay. I heard she, I'm trying to I think can't it, remember yeah. Stacy mentioned it too. Okay. Yeah, she's always talking about Rosario Butterfield and Tim, so maybe her too. So, they, certainly, these people have multiple books out. So, yeah. All right. Anything else? All right. All right. Well, let's pray, and I'll uh, let you we'll close up. Thanks for coming tonight. Uh, thanks for watching online. Uh, Heavenly Father, we love you, and Lord, just pray that uh, as we've gotten this information, I pray, Lord, that that we'll not just have the knowledge, Lord, but you'll give us an opportunity maybe to, to share and to talk with people uh, about it, maybe this week or this month. Uh, Lord, we, we know that, that June June is coming up, this the Pride Month, and Lord, I pray that you'll you'll give us opportunities, as, and we know that, that we'll see things that might anger us or get us upset, but Lord, help us to just respond in, in love, Lord, and, and just know what we expect the world to do certain things because they don't have a relationship with you. Lord, I pray that you'll just give opportunities for us to talk about what we do believe and what the Bible does teach. Uh, thank you for everybody that's here. Uh, we love you and just pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.